The Lord Jesus said of the supper, which, which he instituted, do this in remembrance of me. And it shouldn't need argument to make the point that Jesus should be remembered regularly, constantly indeed, by all his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So right from the start, the church has understood that we should celebrate the Lord's Supper on a regular basis in remembrance and honor of the Lord Jesus. The pattern of the Lord's Supper, um, eating bread and drinking wine, reflects the pattern of things in the annual Passover feast. The Lord's Supper was instituted in the middle of a Passover feast. The Passover feast was instituted by God as a memorial of redemption from captivity in Egypt. And the Lord's Supper is a memorial of redemption from sin and death through the dying, followed by the rising of Jesus our Lord. And the symbolism of eating bread and drinking wine is a symbolism of being nourished. Food and drink nourish the, uh, the body when the body is faint through hunger. A Christian who doesn't see the need regularly to be part of the fellowship celebrating the Lord's Supper is missing something really vital. The Lord said, do it. Why then don't you do it? The question's inescapable. I know that the, and I expect you who are listening to me also know, that the Lord's Supper has been twisted in some people's understanding because of things that they believe about what the bread and the wine has turned into. I simply say, they remain bread and wine, most certainly. But as we eat the bread and in our hearts say, Lord Jesus, I take you as the bread of my life. And as we drink the wine and say in our hearts, Lord Jesus, how could I ever thank you enough for shedding your blood for my salvation? We are nourished in inside. That is to say, we are strengthened, we are refreshed, we find new joy in our hearts, and we go on our way with a new lightness in our step. That's what sharing in the Lord's Supper ought to mean. Take the Lord's Supper a bit more seriously, I beg, and you will find that this is what it does for you. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to SCF Students. Whether you're watching here in the room with us or you're watching online, thank you for joining us. Let's dive right in. Ever since I was a kid, uh, the Lord's Supper and communion has been something that I really love and I re appreciate it and I respect it. I've observed it ever since I was a kid. As a young kid, I grew up Catholic and every Sunday you observe the practice of taking communion. And, and I'll be honest, it was one of those things that I just got into a ritual of. It was something that you just did every single Sunday because you went to church. It wasn't until I turned about 18 or 19 that I started to really uh, understand the significance. I was starting to lead and direct Bible studies and teach. And so the experience of stopping and observing the Lord's Supper became really important to me. I noticed that I had to be really thoughtful and intentional in order to see the act of taking the Lord's Supper as a moment of worship. So today I want us to take a few moments and want us to slow down and really consider what it is that we're doing when we take the Lord's Supper. So what is the Lord's Supper? Maybe you know, maybe you don't know. Regardless, let's talk about it. It's a question that J.I. Packard answered in the video that we just watched. And it's a question that I want us to dwell on together tonight as well. And what better place for us to really observe and look at it than at the table with Jesus and his disciples. If you have your Bible, whether it's online or paper, please open it up to Luke chapter 22. We're going to read it right now, verses 14 to 20. We read this. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And there he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink again until the kingdom of God has come. 
He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The significance of Passover here is incredibly important. Passover was, and still is, a major Jewish holiday that remembers God's deliverance of his people from the slavery of Egypt. Now, while the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God used a man named Moses to stand before the Egyptian leader, Pharaoh, and deliver a message from God, which was simply, let my people go. Maybe you've heard this in a song or a play or a video somewhere, but Pharaoh was stubborn. He refused to set the Israelites free, and so God sent a series of plagues upon Egypt, the final one being the death of the firstborn. Now he sent flies and frogs and blood, uh, water turning to blood, and but the final one was the firstborn. Now, unless people took blood from a lamb and wiped it on their doorpost, their firstborn would die. So in Exodus 12, you can read it there. We read about how the Jews uh, slaughtered lambs and they took the blood and wiped it on the doorpost. And when the angel of death came to kill the firstborn, it passed over. In case you missed it, that's why they call this holiday and this remembrance, a celebration, Passover. It passed over their homes and their children were spared. But everywhere else in Egypt, the firstborn died. It's a pretty significant event and it gives the Israelites really, the Jewish people really, a reason to celebrate. So finally, after all of this, Pharaoh gives in. Pharaoh relents and he lets God's people go free. They're allowed to leave, they can take everything they can with them, and they're allowed to go. So ever since then, the Jewish people have celebrated the Passover as a memorial of their redemption from captivity and God's faithfulness. That's what Jesus and his friends did on this night, just before he was arrested and crucified. They were remembering, they were celebrating, and they were looking back, giving thanks to God for the freedom that their people have experienced. But then Jesus does something incredibly interesting and, and completely off script. He invites them to look forward. This Passover meal took a turn as Jesus twice, not just once, but twice, he mentioned the coming arrival of the kingdom of God, which at this point, he has been teaching them and everyone else for three years. If they've listened, they'd be cluing in. He spoke this intriguing statement that he would not eat again or drink again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And the implication of Jesus' words was that the Lord's Supper anticipates the future feast of the Messiah. He hadn't done the work of the Messiah yet. He was about to. And so that work, which is his death and resurrection, Easter is coming up. Are we cluing into this? That that action would uh, unleash, that it would inaugurate, that it would bring forward the kingdom of God until he returns to make all things new and reigns over new creation. Jesus focused the disciples' attention on this glorious future of the Messiah, and then he broke the bread and passed the cup, and he said, do all of this in remembrance of me. This is a new covenant. In a holy moment, in Passover, as they're recognizing and celebrating, in a moment where faithful believers gather to look back and remember God's covenant and his promises and the faithfulness and, re and the redemption that he had showed them in Egypt, Jesus announces a new covenant, a new promise, that there is new redemption. Now, when we take part in the Lord's Supper, uh, we are to remember his body and his blood given for us. We are remembering the new covenant. So yet again, Jesus shifts their perspective and he shifts our perspectives, taking something old, the old covenant, the redemption from, from Egypt and transforming it into himself. So in Luke, we see how Jesus uh, instituted, he began this idea, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, but it's not called the Lord's Supper in that moment because that's how the Apostle Paul refers it to in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I think his description uh, in, in, in that chapter is an important thing for us to consider alongside this passage of Luke. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28. Find it in your Bibles, open it up if you will. Uh, read along with me. We read this. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're renouncing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Listen, verse 28, we cannot 
miss this, you cannot ignore this. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. As I studied these two passages of Corinthians and Luke, it hit me that, that the Lord's Supper is just not about remembering. There's, of course, a very important aspect of it, but with looking back and remembering and celebrating, we are also invited to look forward as Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 22. And this text from 1 Corinthians 11 from Paul also invites us to look within. In the Lord's Supper, we are invited to look back. We are invited to remember and reflect on what Jesus has done for us. Uh, we, I highlighted these words earlier on, redemption and covenant and faithfulness. All these things are, we are reminded to look back and celebrate and honor and, and appreciate and respect and be thankful for. When we look forward, we are also invited to look forward in eager anticipation for the day that Jesus will come come again and finish what he will start, that he will make all things new. Can we stop there for a second and, and just, just stop on the make all things new? I, as I was preparing this, as I was reading this, as I was even recording this, I had to stop and, and really focus on the word all things. What pain are you experiencing right now? What frustration, what negative emotion, what thoughts of fear and doubt and loneliness are you holding on to for whatever reason jesus says that he will come to make all things new that he will give us a fresh and clean slate what habit are you trying to break and you just can't what addiction are you holding on to you want to you know you have to you you try to but nothing works jesus says he comes to make all things new all things fresh new without fault without a mistake without a history that you're reminded of without anything Brand spanking new. Spanking? Is that the right word? Brand spanking. Spanking new. Brand new. Brand new. And so each time we gather at this table, verse 26 says that we proclaim the glorious future of having all things new. This fragment of bread and this taste of a cup are the first course of an eternal feast that we'll have. Now here's the thing. We're called to look within. Paul says in verse 28 that we must examine ourselves uh, and, and not to do so means that we come to the table in an unworthy manner. And we know that our worthiness, or we should know, is not found in what we can do. We've heard this before. If not, you're hearing it for the first time. It's not in what we can do. Jesus makes us worthy. It's only by placing our faith in him and offering our lives to him as living sacrifices that we become worthy to share this meal. This is why we say at our church that the Lord's Supper is for believing followers of Jesus. We're not trying to exclude anybody. On the contrary, we're inviting anyone and everyone. The Lord's table is open to everybody, but the table is in the dining room. Jesus is the door that's, in, that's found in the, in the Bible. Jesus is the door that we have to go through. And so you need to enter through the door to, in order to sit at the table, but the door is wide open. We, we read in the Bible, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord, then you'll be saved. Saved from what? What do we need to be saved from? Well, we all sin. That's found in Romans. And because we sin, there's consequences to sin. There's, uh, And so we need, we need to be saved from those consequences, from eternal loneliness, from death. Jesus came that we would have life, John 10.10. 10, and and we, we don't have to wait until heaven to have to have life. We can have that life now. We can experience that power and that love and that grace and that passion right now. It doesn't mean that life will be easy peasy. It doesn't mean that you, you won't have days where your car breaks down and your son gets sick and you get super frustrated. That literally happened today in recording. But it will make it easier for you because you will know that God's got this, that he loves you and he's providing and he's supporting and he's making things work for good for you. But in order to experience that and to have that free gift, there's only one thing you have to do. Well, two things, confess and believe. That's it. I wanna encourage you tonight to take some time, maybe pull your small group leader aside if you have to, or even me, and have a conversation. If you've never done that before, if you've never confessed, if you've never truly believed, if you're sitting there thinking, I need to, then talk to us. Don't do it just to have communion because you're a little hungry and you need a snack. Don't do it just because you don't want to be the only one not getting up to take communion. Do it because God is looking at you right now and he's saying simply this, I love you, I accept you, and I want the best for you. Here's the question again, what is the Lord's Supper? Here's an answer that I like. Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of him and his death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. 
It also anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. That is a full theological heavy definition. Here's a simpler one that I found that I like. The Lord's Supper is an invitation to look back, to look forward, and to look within. And when we do that, do you know what we see in each one of those places? A simple Sunday school answer, which is actually really true, is that we see Jesus. We look back and see all that he has done for us. We look forward and we see the day that he will return. And we look within and we see his presence, the only thing that makes us worthy.